Every year at, at this time, the church calendar marks the baptism of Jesus. It's the first story, actually, in the Gospel of Luke. There are no birth narratives in the Gospel of Luke. We just jump right onto the scene with Jesus and his baptism. Again, it's the first story after the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke. Jesus' baptism is, in many ways, the beginning of the good news about who Jesus, at about 30, is as he suddenly pops onto the public scene. And every time I read this story, I'm, I'm captured by the proclamation that it makes, that before, before Jesus has done anything significant, before he's begun his ministry, before he has any disciples, any followers with whom he's shared any of his messages, before he's performed any miracles or healings or, or clashed with religious and political leaders, before anyone, save his family and friends, really knows anything about him, not to mention before anyone has come to see him as the Messiah or the Christ, before Jesus has really done anything to prove himself or his worthiness. Before all of that, he steps from the banks of the Jordan River, wades waist deep into its murky waters, is plunged into it, and raised anew. And while he's still blinking through the water dripping from his eyes and, and hair, the clouds break open and a voice as loud as thunder and as gentle as a whisper proclaims, this is my beloved. This is my child. With him I am so well pleased. And every year at this time as we read this scripture, we too are invited to reflect on our own baptism. Now I recognize that most of us were probably, if we were baptized, infants and too young to remember what that actually, that experience was, was like. Um, some of you may not have been baptized at all. Regardless, the point is the same. That like with Jesus, these waters mark us as God's beloved. They don't make us beloved, but they remind us of a truth that is already there, that we are claimed in God's infinite and irrevocable love, and nothing that anyone ever says or does, nothing that we ever do could change that. Hard stop. Period. Nothing, as the Apostle Paul says, can separate us from the love that God has for us. It's important also to recognize, therefore, that it's not because of anything that we do we prove ourselves worthy, we accomplish this or that, we get straight A's, we are so beautiful that everybody loves us. It's not because of any of that but simply because that's what God's love is. Like, like seeing your baby for the first time after they are raised from the waters, from the baptismal waters of birth. The love simply is. And I'm spending so much time emphasizing this fact this morning, that this love claims Jesus, claims us before anything that he or we do, because I think that for the most part, those of us who claim to follow Jesus and worship the God that he reveals to us have largely only paid this, this reality lip service. This grace, this love lip service. And I wonder what kind of life would flow from this love. If we actually allowed ourselves to be grounded and rooted in this love, what kind of life would actually flow how would we be different? How might the shape of our lives grow and bloom differently? If we could trust that we are washed, held, and could never escape 
this love that is our birthright. I wonder how our world would be different if we could build families and churches and communities and societies that truly lived from this love, this truth. You see, there, you could argue that there is no Christianity apart from this truth. That like its placement at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, before he does anything, it is the foundation on which the house is built. This is the soil in which the garden of life grows. I believe that Jesus could not have done anything that we remember him for except in as much as he lived from this love. I think Jesus reveals to us what kind of human is possible, what kind of transformation is possible when we are so entirely radically rooted in divine love. Because it's, it's not that we are merely called to say and do things that are loving, go on and, and do acts of love and service, to tap into that good old rugged individualism we like so much here in America and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps to, to do more good, to love better, harder, even when we don't really want to. That's not really what the invitation is. It's not to force ourselves to love others but in realizing that when we're struggling to love others, it's because we are not first rooted and grounded in that love ourselves. And so to therefore get back to basics, to the foundation, to the root of things. Grounding our own belovedness in that claim and letting our words and actions flow from there. See, the primary challenge, I think, for many of us is that we live in a world where pretty much everything tries to pull us away from this. It's not that we don't want to live from this love or toward this love, but that we're, we're continually being conditioned not to. Whether it's, you know, commercials and marketing, right, that studies psychology so they can know how to manipulate our brains and, and create desire, that if you just buy our product, then you will be beautiful enough, then you will be worthy of love, then you will be successful enough, strong enough, whatever enough. And we take the bait. Politicians, Democrats, and Republicans Manipulate the masses by playing on our fears, right? Using it to scape, create scapegoats while dividing and dis distracting us from their negligence. How quickly and easily we allow ourselves to be swept up into the hysteria that they create. But fear is insatiable and contagious and only begets more fear. I could go on and on and on. These are the kinds of communities that we create. Prove yourself that you are worthy. Then we will trust you. Then we will praise you. Then we will like you and celebrate you. Prove yourself first. Right, you get the point. As Christians, despite our foundation, we've hardly done more than pay lip service to this foundation. We too often just replicate, re-inscribe, what our world teaches us. But our world hardly has any foundation at all. And so all of us are adrift. And in our flailing, in our anxieties and fears, we reach for the life raft that is easiest, which is scarcity, and sink further down. Only rooting ourselves in the belovedness that is our birthright, which cannot, therefore, be kept to oneself, because what do you do with something that is so great? Well, it only gets better when you share it, right? Who wants to hog the goodness to themselves? It gets better when we share it, and if we've really tapped into that love, we cannot help but become a vessel through which it flows out onto others. 
It must be shared, must infuse and reshape the culture of our communities. Only resting in this belovedness can save us. And I was thinking about this the other night when a friend asked me to help host an open mic night at a local coffee shop. I arrived early, just before 6 o'clock, to help set up, unsure of how the evening would unfold and whether or not anybody would even show. I was entirely unaware of how the few pieces that he had asked me to do would go since I was sort of given last minute notice and I wasn't entirely prepared. But what the heck, you know what, this is what I do. I just get up here and I start doing something and we'll see what happens. Not that that's what's happening this morning, but I opened, I opened with a couple of songs very imperfectly played with about five others on the sign-up list to follow, I thought, you know, okay, this won't take too long. I'll be able to get home early and go to bed because that's my life these days. And I'm going to be honest, some acts were stronger than others, were more polished than others, and many had a moment where they, like me, went, oops, wrong chord, and then continued on or searched for the lyrics and eventually, thinking that we should have finished up by now, I checked the sign-up list and realized that throughout the evening, that list had continued to grow. Throughout the evening, those who came not expecting to share but to simply enjoy the gifts of others had gathered the courage to do just that, from a, a clarinet solo to indie and hip-hop covers to original poetry to a piece of a novel that one young woman is working on. People kept getting up. As each person risked the vulnerability of sharing something deeply personal, something unfinished, imperfect, a raw piece of themselves, it became contagious, and more people said, you know what, I want to get in on that. When someone stuttered or lost their place or the lyrics or, or took a chance on that high note, a voice as loud as thunder and gentle as the breeze would make its way up to the front and say, you got this. Get it, girl. To which one young woman, with an amazing voice, by the way, but as she stammered her way through a chord change at one point, said, oh, you guys are exactly what my heart needed today. You see, just as fear is contagious, so is love. Love that allows people to be imperfect, to show up fully as themselves. As people waded into the murky waters of vulnerability, of, of just beginning, you could see their humanity growing, could feel it blooming. A big smile crept across my face, and I said, well, that's a sermon right there. All right. <laughs> Ready for Sunday. And we all know, at the same time, what what grows in the opposite kind of soil, the judgmental, anxiety-fueled perfectionism. Nobody gets up there to do that. There's one other story that I want to share with you this morning that I think illuminates this truth, and it comes from Father Gregory Boyle, one of my favorite theologians, spiritual leaders. You may have heard me share uh, this story or a version of this story before because I love it so much. Father Greg, is a, he's a Jesuit priest who in 1986 began serving Dolores Mission Church. It's the poorest Catholic parish in Los Angeles. It's a part of LA that has the gang, highest concentration of gang activity as well. But where others saw criminals, Father Greg saw beloved children of God. Eventually, his ministry led him to found what he called Homeboy Industries, which has now become the largest gang intervention and rehabilitation and reentry program in the entire world. And Father Greg, among the many incredible stories that he tells, is one uh, that he did at a training for 600 or so social workers who work with gangs, those coming out of gangs. And he says, I had two homies with me, as the former gang members refer to themselves, 
And one of them was this guy named Jose. And at this event, Jose got up. He's in his late 20s. He now works in a substance abuse part of the Homeboy Industries team. He's, he's in recovery. He's been a heroin addict and a gang member, and he's, you know, he's got tattoos all over his body. He gets up, and he says very offhandedly, you know, I guess you could say that my mom and me, we, uh, we didn't get along so good. I guess I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you kill yourself? You are such a burden. The whole audience, Father Greg says, did exactly what you just did. They gasped. And then Jose, he continues on. You know, he says, it, it sounds way worse in Spanish. And the people did what we just did, which was laugh. And then he continued, you know, I guess, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja, California, and she walked me up to an orphanage, and she said, I found this kid. And then he said, I was there 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her what, uh, where she had dumped me, and she came and rescued me. And then he tells the audience, My mom beat me every single day. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school just to cover my wounds. And Jose loses his battle with his own tears a little bit, and he says, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was so ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now, my wounds are my friends. I've learned to welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my wounds. And he looks out at the crowd and he says, how can I help the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? Or to put it in the language of this morning's scripture, how can we love others if we cannot love ourselves? If we cannot embrace God's love for us, we don't think that we are worthy of it. How can I love the hard-to-do parts of others if I cannot love the hard-to-love parts of myself? When we cannot believe that God loves us as we are warts and all imperfections, mistakes, screw-ups, and all, not in spite of, but there in the fullness of it all, then it just becomes easier to focus on others and their hard-to-love parts and point them out. And as Jose said this, awe came upon everyone, Father Greg says, because, again, we're so inclined to judge this kid who went to prison and is tattooed and is a gang member and is houseless and a heroin addict in recovery. And now he's here teaching us, like Jesus, what it means to be born again as one who is washed in the love of God. And you can imagine that if Jose's mom did that to him, how much she must have hated herself, how much she must have been hurting, because that's where it comes from. It's not an excuse, but it is a tragic and vivid description of what happens when someone spends their entire life growing in the soil of unlove. Most of us maybe aren't that, that far down that road. We're a little bit uh, further in between, and so we think that we can stay there. But that is the end result of what happens if the poison of unlove truly seeps into our roots. You see, love rescued Jose from becoming that same thing himself and has made him an image of Jesus. The life that flows from love is very different indeed than the life that flows from fear and perfectionism. 
which is a sister to unlove. As the author of 1 John says, there is no fear in love. Because love, a fear has to do with judgment. But true love casts out fear. Or perhaps true love creates a space that is safe enough to risk failure, to risk mistakes, because screwing up doesn't make us unlovable. It's something to learn from and, and grow from. It doesn't shake the foundation of our very existence, of our humanity. Because it does not do that when we are grounded and rooted in that irrevocable belovedness. Every such moment can become a moment where we become more fully human, more fully who we were created to be, can be a baptism in a love that will not let us go. And so as you set intentions for who you want to be in the year ahead, may you ground yourself your journey in that radical belovedness that you just reminded yourself of when you marked your forehead with the waters of our baptismal font. God is already well pleased with you. See what flows from there. May it be so. Amen.